<laughs> it's funny, right? Because uh, as I said, Father, at one time he said, "There is no more night, no more evening, no more afternoon. It's morning." So that's why I try to get used to, to say good morning. Doesn't matter what time it is during the day. <clears throat> So, uh, the last lecture we talk about uh, how, uh, how many conditions uh, or bad conditions uh, happen, happen, occur at the time of the fall in the Garden of Eden. And uh, how in the course of restoration, uh, everything have to, have to reverse. So, until now, actually, even the Jewish people, or Christianity has not been able to understand all those hidden secrets uh, in the Bible. No one has been able to, to, to reveal, to understand. Not even Jesus was able to reveal. I'm sure Jesus understood many, many deep things. And uh, he wanted to share with people 2,000 years ago. But unfortunately, the Chosen people, uh, they couldn't uh, accept or recognize uh, Jesus as the one long waiting uh, Messiah, or as the one that God has sent it to them. Could not see in Jesus the Savior. So, <clears throat> but uh, just as uh, we know that the Old Testament was a book of promise, promise uh, God to the chosen people that he will send them the Messiah, that he will send them a savior. Then Jesus came. And Jesus, as we understand, supposed to realize uh, uh, complete salvation to all humankind, realize the three great blessings, and to build the kingdom of heaven on earth, and completely reverse everything. All the conditions were already set. You know, especially the good conditions. But also, there were many bad conditions that the central figures did in the, in the Old Testament era that eventually affected Jesus. If, if anything went wrong with the beliefs of the people, then uh, Jesus' course could go in different direction. So, because he was not able to be welcomed, to be recognized, uh, to be accepted, and once Jesus uh, realized that uh, uh, the heart of the people to believe in him was almost impossible to change, then uh, God has to make some measurements and ask Jesus with such a painful heart to go the alternative course, uh, the way of the cross, to give uh, limit salvation uh, to mankind, then the New Testament actually began, became, again, instead of uh, accomplishing everything 2,000 years ago with the coming of Jesus, it became a testament of promises. Promises that the Messiah will come again. And a promises that eventually men will be able to understand all the hidden heavenly secrets that Jesus was not able to reveal. 2,000 years ago. And we know for sure that uh, those secrets cannot be revealed by any religious leader, by, by any uh, pastor, or even by the Pope, <clears throat> or any prophet, or any saint. Only the Messiah. Right? Uh, that's why when Jesus said, I have Yet many things to say to you that you cannot, cannot bear them now. But when he comes, it talks about one person. When he comes, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. In other words, Jesus could not guide us to the whole truth 2,000 years ago. But he promised that when the Messiah comes, we will understand everything. So what I'm going to share today 
is about the heart of the second coming, and more specifically, you know, based on the Bible, uh, today we talk about the lineage of Jesus, and we talk about uh, the four, five adulterous women. They appear to be adulterous. But we understand that God was working, that this woman actually were righteous women who were reversing uh, the process of the fall and making the conditions to purify the blood lineage so that Jesus can be born sinless. We talk about Tamar, we talk about uh, uh, Ruth, we talk a little bit about uh, Rahab, Barsheba, and Mary, right? So, but uh, uh, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he didn't really talk personally. He didn't talk so much about this. But it was later on that was revealed, actually, the only one that talks about uh, that ancestor was Matthew. You know who was Matthew? He was a tax collector. He was a worker for the government. You know, like a politician, not interested in God's will, but interested in money, right? But somehow he was able to meet uh, Jesus and he changed. And even though uh, he's part of the 12 apostles, even though all of them betrayed Jesus at the last minute, but eventually, I'm sure Matthew was revealed and he shared with us about Jesus' lineage. And he is the one who mentioned, and actually he talks about the lineage of Zachariah too, very clear in the book of Matthew. He comes from the lineage of Abijah, Zachariah. So, but then now about the, the second coming. So, when I was working uh, in Indianapolis in Region 7, I was working as a vice regional leader at that time. It was like uh, I was in charge with my Korean uh, regional leader. I was his vice regional. It was really wonderful. And, uh, and I worked with ministers a lot. You know? So some of the questions that the minister asked, he said, they, they were, they, one time the, he, one pastor asked me, he said, uh, you know, I understand now that uh, Jesus was not just born sinless because God is almighty or God is all powerful or God can do whatever he wants to do. I understand that he was born based on the foundation of faith and substance and all the uh, conditions that Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were able to do. He said, now what, what about River Moon? How can you explain where River Moon comes? So Father also doesn't talk so much about that, but uh, Father uh, comes, right, on the foundation of Jesus' victory, right, uh, on the foundation of Jesus' victory. But again, even though our true parents come on that victorious foundation of Jesus on the cross, you know, not because of the cross, but also because of his obedience to God and his incredible love, for those who were killing him, to forgive those people uh, uh, on the cross. And Jesus, even though Satan used all his might and power to destroy Jesus' body, to prevent Jesus from realizing the three great blessings, but because of Jesus' heart, Heavenly Father was able to use all his power and might without giving no explanations to Satan, and resurrected Jesus. And uh, on that foundation, the two parents come. But even though he comes on that foundation, still, true parents, God have to work for those uh, remaining 2,000 years ago to pre-prepare the lineage or continue that lineage so that true parents can be born sinless. So, in the same way, this is a divine uh, revelation from God. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, not many of you heard this 
it's a simple lecture, but uh, it's going to give us more understanding about our true parents. Our true parents is the most precious fruit that ever has walked the face of the earth. And you are true parents result. True parents is the, the fruit of the uh, 6,000 biblical years of God's work in blood and sweat and tears and the work of the righteous people of the Old Testament and the righteous people of the New Testament era, especially the righteous Korean men and women that participated in the purification of the blood lineage so that our true parents can be born uh, sinless. So let's go then. Where will Christ return again? The Messiah will be born on earth and he is not coming in the spiritual body. He will be born in a new nation, chosen and predestined by God. By the way, when that pastor asked me, uh, it's like God managed that uh, we couldn't keep talking. People interrupt us, and I say, we talk later. That night, I really prayed to Heavenly Father, and I came with this, this kind of, uh, uh, somehow God was able to reveal uh, some secrets in the, in, in, in the Bible. Actually, everything is in the Bible concerning true parents. It's amazing. So the Messiah will be born. He will be born in a new nation, chosen and predestined by God. Will the Messiah return to the Jewish people? Many Christians believe that the Lord of the second coming of Jesus will return uh, to the Jewish people because many parts of the Bible, uh, based on those biblical Bible codes, they are very confident and sure that the Lord will return to the Jewish people. So, in the book of uh, uh, Revelations, or it says Apocalypse is here, Revelation 7, 4, it reads, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, uh, 144 out of every tribe of the people of Israel. This sounds like, uh, you know, that's what the Messiah, talking about the second coming, those that were, were sealed by the, by the Lord in his second coming. In the book of Matthew 10, 23, Jesus said, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel when you will see the coming of the Son of Man. It means not only that he was going to come to Israel, but soon, like some of you, not even finished going through all the towns. But we know that uh, they finished Jerusalem, Samaria, Rome, Greece, and all over the world, and the Messiah didn't come, right? So it must have some different meaning. In Matthew 16, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His glory. So many people thought, yeah, He will come here because some of us are still going to be alive when the Messiah returns. They all die. Generations pass and generations come and went. And 2,000 years have passed. All those, they died. And the Messiah didn't come. But on these verses, People uh, have that idea. So will the Messiah return to the nation of Israel? To understand this clearly, Christians and all of us, we have to know every single detail in the providence of restoration. If we don't understand the details in restoration, it's very difficult. Very difficult to, uh, to solve our own situation. Father always said, study and pray deeply so you may know who I am and you may know <clears throat> all the details in the providence of restoration. So we must understand the principles of restoration. <coughs> Jesus spoke about the second coming and he clearly taught that the Messiah will not come to the nation of Israel. That the blessings that originally was given to the people, to the Jewish people, to the nations of Israel, the nation of Israel, is taken away from God and given to another nation that will produce the fruits. A nation that will really do 
the will of God. So Jesus clearly indicated in the parable of the vineyard that the Lord will not return to the nation that persecuted him, rejected him, and killed him. You know, everybody's familiar with this parable of the vineyard, where God is the land owner, and he planted a vineyard, and he rented to some tenants. And then uh, when the time of harvest uh, came, he sent uh, some servants to collect the fruits. But the tenants were very bad. They killed all those that uh, the landowner uh, sent, and they stoned them. And they sent again more, and they were also killed and stoned. And then this landowner said, now I'm going to send my son. They will respect my son because he is my son. He is the Savior. Mm -hmm. But when they saw the son, they said, let us kill him yeah. and take the inheritance. So then Jesus, when he was given this parable, he said, what will that landowner uh, do to those wretched uh, people? So they said, they will kill them and do this and that. Jesus said, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to another people, to another nation. They will produce the fruits of it. So, and uh, if you know that, that uh, parable, clear, right? The, the land owner represents God. The tenants to whom he lent that land were the chosen people, the Jewish people. And the servants that uh, God sent were the prophets. But as we know, uh, the Jewish people, even like Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they kill all the prophets and stone all those who are sent unto you. How often I will gather your children as a hen gather her, her brood under her wind, and you will not. You will not willing. So that's why uh, Jesus, uh, in that parable, uh, uh, the prophets uh, are the, uh, the servants, and the son is Jesus. They kill the Messiah. So the moment the chosen people rejected, persecuted, and killed the Son of God, they lost their qualification as chosen from that moment. Why Jesus said that he would return to Israel? To clarify this matter, we must understand the real meaning of the word Israel. Israel means victorious one, victorious in faith, and it comes from the fight that Jacob had with the angel. Remember, uh, in the past lecture we said that uh, Jacob was wrestling with, uh, with the angel, right? And then, because uh, Jacob was such an incredible man, even though his time was dislocated, he didn't give up until you bless me, you yeah? Meaning until you return the blessings that you took, took away from God, even to Adam and Eve. And then the blessed, and then, uh, then the angel told him, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. From now on, your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel. Because you have been victorious with men, I mean with God and with men. Victorious on the foundation of faith and the foundation of substance. So, and then from Jacob, whose name was changed, Eventually, the family of Israel came about, the tribe, uh, the society, and the nation. And then, that's how the nation and the name Israel was born, meaning a victorious one, victorious in faith, and victorious in substance. Now, to the chosen people 2,000 years ago, were victorious in faith in relationship to Jesus? No. They rejected him. They persecuted him. And eventually they killed him. That's why in the book of Romans 9, he said, For not all Israelites truly belong to Israel. Romans 11. But through their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles as to make Israel jealous. In Romans 10, 19, 21. I will make you jealous with those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. I have been found by those who did not seek for me. I have shown myself.
to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he said, all day long, I have held out my hand to a disobedient in a country people. Romans 9.25 As indeed, he says to Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there shall be called children of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the numbers of the children of Israel were like the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Even in the Old Testament, it was prophesied because uh, the Jewish people in their history repeatedly uh, acted against God's will, repeatedly disobeyed God. In the book of Ezra uh, 1, 24, What shall I do to you, O Jacob? You, Judah, will not obey me. I will turn to other nations, and I will give them my name, so that they may, be, may keep my status. Because you have forsaken me, I also will forsake you. When you beg mercy of me, I will show no mercy. When you call to me, I will not listen to you, for you have defiled your hands with blood, and your feet are shifted to commit sin and murder. It is not as though you had forsaken me. You have forsaken yourselves, says the Lord. So in the Old Testament, actually God warned the nation of Israel to be careful. You know? Moses said so clear, God will raise up a prophet like, me, like myself. You shall believe in him. You shall listen to him, and you shall obey him. And that people, nation, or people that does not believe in that and, and the Messiah will be totally be wiped out. That's what the Moses said. Yeah. 1,600 years before Jesus was born. Therefore, the chosen people, after the crucifixion of Jesus, are not this descendants of Abraham, rather, the new chosen people are the Christians who inherit the faith of Abraham. In other words, the Messiah will be born in a Christian nation, chosen, blessed, and predestined by God. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about that nation. The three stages of growth. As we know, everything in the created world grows by the autonomous of the principle, right? God did not give commandment to the donkeys, to the animals, or monkeys, or horses. Also, they don't have uh, free will, and they were not given responsibility, and they were not given the three blessings. Only to us, only to human beings. So we know the creation grows by the autonomous of the principle. In the case of human beings, as long as we receive all the necessary elements that are required for us to grow physically, we can grow also by the autonomous of the principle. You know, we get the uh, positive physical elements like sun, air, the atmosphere, the negative uh, physical elements, which is water and food and the love of our parents. Yeah, we can grow. The human beings, we are not just like animals. We are spiritual beings. We are eternal beings. We know that uh, we grow. We have another body that grows, receiving different types of uh, spiritual elements. So only to us, it was, it was given free will, it was given a responsibility. In other words, we understood, uh, as we talked uh, in the last lecture, did Adam and Eve, doing their growth to perfection, they're supposed to properly use their own free will, 
fulfill the responsibility, God's given responsibility to have absolute faith, absolute love, and absolute obedience in God's commandment, doing their growth to perfection. But we realize that on the top of the growth stage, Adam and Eve were defiled, were deceived by Lucifer, and they failed. They forsake God, betray God, abandon God, and listen to another, uh, the servant that eventually became like their, their own God, false God, and a false father. So the fall happens. We realize you know, to the principle that if Adam and Eve will have completely fulfilled their responsibility and, that, uh, and realize the three great blessings in that kind of world, there is no need for religion. Do you think Heavenly Father likes religion? No. He never created human, humankind to be religious people and never to communicate with God through religion, through conditions. We're supposed to be one with God and be born uh, through God's own love, life, and lineage. But because of the fall, uh, uh, religion became necessary, and because of the fall, restoration became necessary. And why? Because God is our parent. God loved mankind more than we love ourselves, because we are his children. When Adam and Eve fell, Heavenly Father, as a parent, he felt responsible to restore his children, to restore Adam and Eve as God, as a creator, and as a parent. Father knows, every parents know, that if you have never created Adam and Eve, this mess will have never occurred. So, with the heart of the parents, Heavenly Father began the providence of restoration. Have no choice. Even fallen parents, when children fall into troubles, they're doing their very best to resolve any situation. Match God who is good. We are not such a good people. Jesus, uh, one time he talked to the people and he said, he asked, if your child asks you for a piece of bread, will you give a stone? And they said, no. If your child will ask you for a fish, will you give a snake? And if your child will, will ask you for, uh, 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 what other fruit did he say? For, uh, for an egg, will you give a scorpion? And they all said, no. He said, if you're being bad, you want to give good things to your children. How much our Heavenly Father, who is good, how much he wants to give? So with that kind of heart, our parents of goodness, he wants to save us. And with that kind of heart, God began the providence to save humankind who died in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. In other words, the principles of creation, everything uh, that was created, requires to go to the three stages, formation, growth, and completion. We all know, all know that, right? We heard the, the principles of creation many times. Okay. So, God has to prepare some principles of restoration. Restoration also has to go to three stages. We know that Heavenly Father is the God, is the God Heavenly Parents, is the God of the number three, right? That's how we find a lot of number threes uh, with God in no Adam's family, in Noah's family, in Abraham's family, and Moses, and Jesus. You know, there's three blessings, three main archangels. We have three stages of life. Life in mother's womb, life on earth, life in the spiritual world. There were three blessings given to us. Jesus, for example, three wise men came from the east, three main disciples, three temptations, three hours of darkness, three questions to Peter, three denials to Peter. So many number threes, right? So, in other words, 
everything that God tried to accomplish in the course of restoration, if it's not be, if it's not fulfilled, if it's not realized at the first attempt or at the second attempt, then for sure at the third attempt will be fulfilled. Even if there's some mistakes in the third stage. Even if there's failures, there is room for Heavenly Father to continue and make the third attempt for everything. We can see in the history of restoration that the third must be fulfilled. For example, foundation of faith in substance. It took three, three times. Adam's family failed when Cain killed Abel. No second chance was given to them. Noah's family, Noah was victorious, but his family did not unite with Noah. So as a result, the providence in Noah's family, which was the second time, ended up in failure, and no second chance was given to Noah's family. But on the contrary, a curse came over them. 400 years of slavery, uh, Canaan. I right, became a slave to his, his own brothers. But then, in the third attempt to Abraham's family, even though Abraham made a mistake, right? But God gave a second chance to Abraham. And eventually, the providence to establish foundation of faith and substance at the third attempt, even though it was a mistake, Heavenly Father gave a second chance. And some conditions were used that the foundation of faith and substance end up to be victorious. And the providence to purify the blood lineage so Jesus can be born sinless began with those three generations. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even though you see the families, you know, Jacob is the greatest victor, victor in the history of the Old Testament, right? Incredible. What about his children? Were his children very united, loving one another? No. All the brothers wanted to kill the youngest, Joseph, right? And some of them defended him. They didn't kill him. But they sold it in slavery to Egypt. And then Joseph's family massacred and killed uh, the family, the Tina, their sister Mary. They didn't like this family, so they wiped out. So they were not so good people. But the strong conditions they were made, they still, God used these people. Jesus was still born from the lineage of uh, Judah, who also participated in selling Joseph. Isn't it true? It's incredible. Incredible. What the third stage has room uh, for God to keep working. So, foundation of resurrection also, Three attempts. The building of the temple, which represents the Messiah, God tried to do it. First attempt to King Saul. The King Saul betrayed God. No second chance. Even though he repented, no forgiveness. Then King David. God loved King David, but he, made, he shed so much blood. He couldn't uh, align himself with God completely. But he repented, really. He fasted for seven days and ashes and really repent. I think God listened to his uh, prayer that no second chance was given to him personally, but then uh, the third attempt, David's son, Solomon, eventually was able to build a temple. So we realized that the third attempt eventually was victorious and the building, the temple was built by King Solomon that represents the Messiah. That means in the time of the United Kingdom of Israel, uh, at that time, actually the Messiah was already, symbolically Messiah was already on earth. If the chosen people only had united around the temple and protect the temple and you know, make a preparation, the Messiah could have come. At that time, on, 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 a, on a government, there is hierarchy, easy, for Messiah to be welcome if he, is, if he is born in the house of the king. One word and one decree of the king can everybody recognize the Messiah. 
but uh, we know Solomon fell into corruption and eventually made so many bad conditions. So in the future, Jesus' physical body can be attacked and struck by Satan. So the providence of restoration and the building of the kingdom of heaven on earth will be realized also at the third attempt. This is very important for us to realize that, to understand. You have to feel in your, in your bone, in your blood, even though we're going through difficulties and ups and downs, that this is the third attempt of our Heavenly Father to build the kingdom of heaven. The words that God gave in Isaiah 46, he said, I have spoken, I have purposed it, and I will do it. So this is the chance for all humankind, because there's incredible blessing from God, incredible conditions that God has at the third attempt. And in other words, like, uh, why no conditions? Adam and Eve were invaded by Satan in the second stage. Right? As teenagers, in the growth stage, they were dated by Satan. But from the growth stage to the perfection level, Satan has no condition. Also, Satan had invaded the first family uh, and killed one from the side of God, Abel, and invaded also Noah's family. So, but in the third attempt, then uh, God can get somebody even who has belonged to Satan. Abraham was from the satanic realm. He was the son of idol worshiper. You know? So on the side of Satan. Because God has that right in the third attempt. Get somebody from Satan and make it victorious to the side of God. So in our time, we have that kind of a, a foundation in that kind of condition to make things victorious for God and for true parents. We have that. We have to understand that. So, in other words, we live in, in the time of the second coming. Even though we might see earthquakes and storms and everything in our movement, but the kingdom of God is being established and it will go on no matter what happens. Because Heavenly Father has that condition. The three stages of restoration. First Adam then becomes like a formation stage. Second Adam, Jesus. We know that uh, Jesus was killed. Jesus became perfect individually. Realized God's ideal on the individual level. But he was rejected. Then the second coming for sure will be victorious and fulfilled. So even uh, when we look about uh, God's given word, we have the Old Testament era, it's like formation stage. New Testament era, growth stage. Complete Testament age is a perfection level that eventually will realize God's ideal on this earth. The Bible contains many heavenly secrets, mysteries, parables, and symbols. However, these mysteries will not remain as secrets forever. They will be clarified. And as I said before, we should be grateful because all those heavenly secrets have been declared, revealed, unlocked by our true parents. The birth of these three men is without original sin. Adam, Jesus, and true parents are different from all of us. From all of us. They come from the sea of God directly. So Adam supposed to reach uh, perfection, but he fell on the growing period. Jesus became one with God, became perfect, but only half. You know, he is on the individual level, and he was crucified. So the will of God was not done. Then the Lord of the Second Coming, true parents, this is the third attempt for God to save humankind and to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. So that responsibility and the position of the chosen people 2,000 years ago 
when Jesus came was so incredible. What do you think about your position? Our responsibility. Everything we do will affect the past, present, and future, for good or for bad. It will determine what we do. So, how will we know these things? In the book of Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing without first revealing his secrets to his servant, the prophets. So, the time of the second coming is the, like Normandy, the day, the most important event ever in human history. So God will not keep those secrets as secrets forever. It will be revealed. That's why Jesus, I told you, Jesus said, I have still many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Also, the book of Acts declares very clear, in the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and young men will see visions. That's why many of us, your parents, a lot of your parents, were guided by the spirit world directly and let us know who Father was. So many of us, we don't believe in the in true Father as Messiah. Of course the principle is most important. But many of us were guided directly by God, by Jesus, or by ancestors or angels about who the Lord of the second advent is. Who is the Messiah? Corinthians said, for now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect comes, then that which is in part shall be done away. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then I will see face to face. In other words, the Bible itself says, I'm not complete. I'm imperfect. I only give things in part. But when he comes, when the one who is perfect comes, Everything that is mediocre or in part will pass away. But in the last days when the seventh angel is blowing his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he announced to his servants, the prophets. In other words, everything will be unlocked. Every, everything will be clarified. No more mysteries. No more mysteries. Revelation 14, 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to be proclaimed to those who live in the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. To everyone. I mean, this is talking about the completed testament age that the Jesus revealed to the angel. And Jesus received all these revelations from God. God gave to Jesus the book of Revelation. Jesus revealed to the angel and the angel to John the Divine and from John the Divine to all mankind. The purification of the blood lineage. <clears throat> As we know, foundation of faith and substance, right? Adam and Eve supposed to, uh, I'm sorry, Adam's family supposed to realize that God wanted to send the Messiah right in Adam's family, they came to Abel, end up in tragic failure. In Noah's family, even though Noah was victorious, uh, but Noah's family could not unite. That's why we have to be careful, Jesus said about the second coming. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man comes. You might see that kind of a uh, Difficulties also. Abraham's family, eventually, as I said before, even though he made a mistake, but it was given a second chance. And to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, eventually, the long wish of God to have these conditions made so he can begin the providence 
to purify the blood lineage was victorious. And from then on, that's when God used the chosen people. And that's where the woman, the righteous woman, the righteous deeds of the, the people that participated in the Old Testament to purify the lineage so Jesus can be born sinless, uh, became victorious because Abraham. That's why the Bible say, Jesus said, don't be foolish. Don't lie to yourselves. God, don't you, did, didn't you hear that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God is now the God of the dead. He called dead to those people who thought that God was their God. So, uh, 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 the third attempt was realized. Isaiah 46, 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my purpose shall stand and I will fulfill my intentions. So actually, what I'm trying to say here, God is declaring what is going to take place in the ends of times. Ends of times means the coming of the Messiah, the end of evil, and the beginning of the new history of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth, is prophesied even from the book of Genesis. Uh, declaring from the beginning, uh, and from ancient times, things not yet done. Right? So God is omniscient, he knows past, present, and he can perceive the future. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He could see the possibility of Jesus' crucifixion. Knowing this, he cannot miss the opportunity to use the victorious foundation of faith and substance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Heavenly Father knows how difficult it was for these conditions to be victorious. Ignoring the possibility that Jesus might be killed, God has to be prepared. Plan B. If plan A is not uh, realized, then plan B will be victorious. And that plan B will be the third attempt for God. So, on the foundation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three individuals, are one, he says one, that is count as one person. The victory of Abraham is the victory of Isaac. The victory of Isaac is the victory of Abraham. The victory of Isaac is the victory of Jacob. The victory of Jacob is the victory of Isaac. So they all are one. How God knew about the crucifixion of Jesus? It was revealed even from the time of Noah. You know about the, after the flood? In Noah's time, it records in the Bible that Noah took a, a dove 